Rorschach, Gishda, 69. Kevin Rorschach, and my number is 58. And Jen, Most of the dancers, hearing and deaf, have never danced before. And many of the deaf dancers have been told all their life that they can't dance, they can't participate in that, they can't hear the music. But dance doesn't, dance isn't the music. Dance is in of itself, really. We use music, but Dance is an entity of its, an experience on its own. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then you go around eight counts, around eight counts, in four, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's just try up to there. Our dance company is comprised of people with, you know, years and levels of skill to people who haven't danced at all. And I always thought, you know, um, kind of why it was, you know, such a big mix. And basically, um, I asked him and he explained that, you know, some people don't get the opportunity to ever do this again. And so, you know, why not offer them opportunity? And, and I can appreciate that because, you know, there was, you know, again, just three years ago, I was that same person that would have, would have never made it into any dance company or would have never, you know, had the, had the guts to stand up in front of, you know, hundreds of people and dance. Most people who have had a lot of training and a lot of um, uh, experience on the stage don't want to work with people who don't have a lot of experience on the stage because they don't have the same level of, well, experience and, and uh, maybe even dedication. It just depends. But um, this relationship is, is it's incredible. the way we do deaf theater. The hearing students interpret what the deaf actor's doing. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to somehow integrate everybody. And the dance program already does that. We're almost half and half hearing and deaf. So I thought, well, wait a minute. What about doing a dance version of The Wiz? And yet create our own identity. So I didn't want it to be The Wiz or The Wizard of Oz, but I wanted it to be both a, an integration of those things and yet something in its own right.
I told Tom I do want to repeat what everybody I mean expected. The ones came the same old, but the same old, like they need to move you to the garden. It put me in a perfect mode, became a metaphor for the evolution of American pop culture and consciousness. I mean, what we are aware of is like an older. Look it back, look it back. So we started up with cancer. In 1929, we around the depression. I don't move to a shop. The expectation is that we are going to copy the movie. Then, after that, the tornado comes. The expectation got to out the window. It was one of those things that just sort of an image that popped up into my head of whirling dervishes for their tornado dancers. And I can't even explain why it came up, but it did. And when I was talking to Thomas, I was like, well, what do you think about this? To get the feeling of a tornado on stage that sort of contained chaos, nature at its worst and best together, a sort of spiritual awakening. And that was the way to, to bring it forth. How to produce that concept in a way that my shop workers can do, that fits in our budget, that fits in our time constraint, is like another, is like the step two of the process. Each friend represented a different dance. Um, you know, Dorothy represented ballet, and the kind of 
innocence that ballet has, the kind of um, yet traditional and structured, but has within it this self-expression of purity and um, almost ethereal quality, which takes us again to this dream place. When I first sort of mentioned this idea, Kelly was immediately saying, well, I want to be Dorothy with red shoes. And I said, well, yeah, maybe, you know. She was very, very determined to play Dorothy. But when it came down to the audition, I actually did say to her that, you know, well, you're going to audition like everyone else. And, uh, you know, there may be, I don't know, there may be somebody who comes along who might be a better Dorothy. I don't know that. Kelly came from a different place in the sense than most of the other dancers because she had been involved with dance a lot. She was kind of the bigwig in this group. And so sometimes the, a person in that position has to go through a period of humbling before they actually find themselves. And she had to really, I think, fight within herself to find a balance between, yes, I have maybe more technique than some people, and yet I still have to fit into this ensemble. I've worked as the master electrician who's responsible for all the lighting equipment and all the, the television communications and stuff like that. I've been working with them since my first year of college, so about two and a half years, almost three years now. I worked in deaf theater. However, this is my first show as a stage manager. It kind of adds a new excitement to everything because, you know, I'm not that good at sign. The kids are gonna come in. The kids are gonna come in, and the munchkins will go to their places where they are right now. Okay. Then the music can start for the Probably the biggest problem that we have here so is uh, communication breakdowns. You know, could you please go do this? And then at least that's what you think you're saying, but you end up being interpreted as something completely different. Forty-five minutes later, the job still isn't done. You're like, what was the what? Did I, and then, what did I say? You know, what did I say that made them do that? <laughs> you know, I didn't. I thought I said this. I'm like, no, you didn't say that. <laughs> like, oh, okay. We use a lot of visual cues here. Now, the visual cue system, uh, like most hearing people, have the headsets and they communicate with each other um, in different areas. You would you cue up your sound person or, or the light, for example, using the headset. But here at NTID, we're all deaf, so we use the visual cue system. So we use a TV and a camera, and the camera is pointed to the operator and the TV monitor. You can see the other areas of the, uh, of the, the tech parts. So what we do is we sign on the camera and let them know when it's time for everything to be ready on set. So, is the fly ready? Yes. And then we use our cues. Ready, go. The woman who's playing Adipearl, Mary, uh, works here on staff. 
not a dancer, not a performer per se, but as I've watched her in her role as the uh, Atta Pearl Witch, she's just blossomed into this sort of actress. I am Atta Pearl, the not so perfect witch. I was walking around looking, being nosy as usual, and uh, I asked them, you know, how do people get in it? And they said, they told me, you know, that I could try out for something. So um, I told them, well, yeah, I probably would, you know. So I asked him, he, he described the show, and I tried out, and gave, he gave me this part. It is fun, even though uh, my husband doesn't want me to. He wants me to stay home. The only thing I ever really wanted to do was sing, but I never did because I'm, I'm nervous of being in front of people. Actually, I'm terrified of being in front of people, but since this isn't a speaking part, I figured I'd try it out and see if I could do it. So far, you know, I, I believe I could do it though. I believe I could do it. It is bringing out a little something in me, which at this late age, everybody probably thinking I'm going crazy now. <laughs> Thank you.
Now, step dancing has its history traced back to Africa, the stomping of the feet and the sort of connection to the earth. And that that kind of movement moves you through space um, is kind of like the earth moving you. Or, uh, so I wanted that sense of um, the yellow brick road sort of had its own live identity. And also, the yellow brick road was sort of looking out for them. show is all dance so there's no words to communicate feelings and things like that so you need to give that to the audience you know what's going on things like facial expression was very important and being an interpreter helped me with that so what I did is I actually just looked in the mirror and I mean it was very humiliating but like looked in the mirror and just like growled 
you know, and I closed the door in the lab, closed the curtains and like growled and made faces that like a lion would make. The first day of dress rehearsal that I put the suit on, it, I mean, it was, you know, I laugh now, but it was, it was totally unbearable. I, I was actually on the verge of passing out. Um, a couple times and, and you know and, and, and the frustration of okay I have like 10 to 15 extra pounds of stuff I have like obstructions with the tail I have like how do I you know accomplish some of the movements yeah so it was a lot of you know what kind of character would that bring out this big suit but actually the I think the good thing about it is when I finally got the mask um, it really completed the line so the day I put the mask on and we had our first opening night show the, the moment I put the mask on, I was immediately the lion. It's been all showing up at a party at dress rehearsal. Move your face around a little bit, squish it up and down, and there you go. Thank you very much. Yeah, every, oh, wow. every little wrinkle on your face. No. <laughs> Everything's wrong. Right. That's great. And now what I'm going to do is, right now I'm going to put a wet towel on here though to keep it moist because if I don't, it'll shrink. Put it this way. Part of him. I burn hair and, and I lost my hair and when I was three years old. I was sick with a fever. But as for me growing up as a heart of him, I don't see no different. It's just that the thing of the music, but I also can hear the words. It's that too. So it's the pain of the tone of the voice of the music. I'm born in Jamaica, dancing pop uh, culture. We sleep dancing, we eat dancing, we love dancing. So if we hear some music, we just get up and dance. I mean, there's more than dancing, there's food, there's more about the history. <laughs> You know, overall, things are wonderful. There's all the little daily crises. Um, right now, we've had people kind of drop out which seems in a cast of 63 people is not a big deal. Ease on down. Ease on down the road. We're driving the costumer nuts. She's trying to design costumes and we keep, you know, oh, this person dropped out. Oh, this person's not in that dance anymore. We moved him to this dance. Come on, Dorothy. Don't you care about nothing? That might be a
at first we had a major barrier where I was trying to, you know, cue multiple people at multiple times. And it's not as easy as just saying, lights, go, sound, go, set, go, you know, fly in this. You have to call cues earlier than when you really want them to happen because, uh, because there's a relay that goes through, like, I'll be up here in the booth and I'll tell Joe to go. And then Joe turns around and then tells the crew to go. And some of them still can't see, so it still goes through yet another person sometimes. So sometimes you've got four or five people saying go before something actually happens. Actually, at some point in my mind, I thought, boy, my, I may end up playing the Wiz if I don't find somebody. And Gio did happen to come along, and I don't remember now. But when I saw him move, he, he kind of reminds me of the Joel Grey character in Cabaret. I gave him little bits and pieces and ideas and concepts and some movement, but he really took that and molded this character, um, which he did very well. It just happened on Saturday. This is two days ago, so it's, you know, there's so many variables to consider, you know. I can't, it's not the kind of thing where I can just go, okay, well, we're sorry, goodbye, and here, next understudy come in. We, we're not quite in that position. I just remember hearing the noise, the pop, 
Yeah, it still makes me cringe to, to think about it. And feeling the, the pain, which felt like someone just really reared back and kicked me in my Achilles. And I remember turning around to see who was behind me and who had kicked me. Um, I think my next thought was, I'm not going to be in the show. And that was my very first thought outside of this hurts. <laughs> I emailed him and said, okay, it looks like this is no good. I'm not going to be able to be in the show. And he emailed me back and said, okay, let's not focus on what we can't do. Let's focus on what we can do. And so he said, who says, who says Glenda has to be on her feet? And so maybe we can do this in a wheelchair or there's an, or we can fly you in. He was starting to, you know, cook up all these schemes on what we could do. And finally, uh, I talked to Thomas on the phone and I said, you know, I feel like there's about a week and a half left. It was time to, to relinquish the part. Having this opportunity to be Glenda, um, it was, I was, I appreciated it. Thank you very much. There is a excitement in being able to co-create and to uh, bring to life something that was just never there. Twenty-five, thirty years from now, when these students think about this experience, they're probably not going to remember the dances, but they're going to remember the feeling. They're going to remember the the spirit that we created here.
did you think about when I was doing that? That was my witch's brew I was making. Yeah. <laughs> right.